This is Bob Goodman. You're watching the TV Writer Podcast. The TV Writer Podcast is back, and it's better than ever. You can now find dedicated audio-only feeds at iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, and Pandora. You can access the video version via YouTube, iTunes, Podbean, and on the web at tvwriterpodcast.com. Follow me on Twitter, at Gray Jones is my handle, and be sure to like the podcast and post reviews on all of these aggregators. During the Shelter at Home order in April 2000, we'll be posting weekly episodes. Listen for the contest code later in the episode. If you follow me on Twitter and tweet the contest code to me within four days, you'll be entered into a draw to win two rolls of toilet paper. Who says we can't have a little fun during quarantine? This episode is brought to you by Pilar Alessandra. You may know Pilar Alessandra as the author of The Coffee Break Screenwriter and host of the On the Page podcast. She asked me to offer you 10% off her interactive online class, Writing the First Draft, running six Saturdays, April 4th to May 9th. This interactive class takes you from idea to pages with entertaining lessons and actionable writing tools. It's open to screenwriters and filmmakers and is taught through Zoom conference in real time. You can find the class by going to onthepage.tv. To get your 10% off code, use the coupon onthepage10 at checkout. Please check out her other classes as well. I can't think of a better way to spend your time while you're sheltering at home during this virus. This interview with Bob Goodman was my last in-person interview before the stay-at-home order here in California. I'll be doing Skype interviews until we get an all-clear for the virus. You're going to love the interview. Let's roll. Well, this is great, and I'm here with executive producer of Elementary and winner of two Daytime Emmy Awards for his animation series writing, and then also lots of credits in live action, including Warehouse 13 and Elementary. Bob Goodman, how are you doing? Hey, Gray. Good to be here. And we're, this is my very first time recording at the Writers Guild. It's, it's very exciting. Yeah, we got, uh, we got a little room all to ourselves mm -hmm. at the Writers Guild of America West. Yeah. And I do want to say for viewers who are just catching up with the podcast, we've had a long break, but we are back with lots of interviews. And I'm hoping to focus more, like uh, Bob here, on the executive producer level, high-level writers. And I hope this is a help to sort of the staff and mid-level writers. We were having a little bit of a discussion about that before we started. Yeah, we were, we were talking right before you, you rolled cameras about how there's, there's a lot of information for people just getting started. Um, and the Writers Guild has what's called the Show Owner Trainees, Training Program for people who are approaching the, the top levels. Uh, and there's a real sort of dearth of information for, for folks in the middle. Uh, you just mentioned uh, uh, Javi uh, Grigio Markswatch and, and Jose Molina, who did a course for uh, mid-level writers specifically at the Guild recently. I was really happy that they did that. I've been saying for years that that's an area where there's a need. Um, and beyond that, though, there's, there's not a lot of info. So mm -hmm. great. Let's talk about it. Yep, absolutely. And uh, for I do recognize that there's a lot of people watching this podcast who want to break in. And in the show notes of this episode, I'm going to put a, a couple of links. One to the Creative Writing Career podcast that, uh, that Bob did in episode eight of that podcast. And also another one with uh, Storybeat, was it? Storybeat.net, uh, hosted by Steve Cuden, who's a, a friend from animation writing for, for many years. Uh, that one's also available on all platforms. Yeah. And both of those go at great length into breaking in. And I, I don't want to I, retread I, those waters. I expend a lot of wind, yeah. as I am wont to do. Though one thing I, I would mention that you didn't um, mention in either of those is uh, I, I have a special interest because my daughter wants to be a TV writer. She's 17 now. Um, is do you have any thoughts on the various programs in LA, college programs like UCLA, UCLA Extension, USC, um, other programs around here? Uh, in terms of them helping you break into the business as a writer or in terms of them helping you learn how to write? Like, uh, helping to learn how to write before, yeah. obviously you can't break in at that level, right. but as you learn to learn the craft and prepare a body of material. Like, like anything else, there's going to be a, a range of quality. Uh, uh, if, uh, if you're lucky enough to find a good program, and I think you're just going to find that by word of mouth from other people who've taken it, um, then absolutely you're, you're going to learn good lessons in those courses. 
uh, I think the, the most important thing about doing courses like that is uh, the structure that it provides a starting writer. Uh, in addition to just learning the craft, and we'll talk a lot about that, I'm sure, um, one of the things that, that writers early in their personal career as a writer need to um, build muscles for is the, the, the structure of doing it like it's a job, um, doing it on a schedule, imposing deadlines for yourself. Um, and taking a class is a great way to, to get yourself into that. Um, having somebody else out there, a teacher, say, okay, I want this many pages on this day, um, it's actually going to help you develop those muscles. A big part of becoming a professional writer is ritualizing the writing. Um, you can't wait for the muse to hit or wait for writer's block to pass. You got to plant your butt down in front of that laptop or however you're set up uh, every day for, for long chunks of time. And sometimes it's just staring at the paint peeling and sometimes it's getting a lot of pages out. Uh, but you got to do it, and you got to force yourself to have deadlines, and you got to force yourself to to produce product. Hmm. Um, beyond that, you're also going to do the other thing that's great in all these, um, in, in, whether it's a school, film school, um, uh, going to mixers. It's it's also a big part of meeting. You know, big part of it is meeting people hmm. uh, and making contacts. So if you're going to one of these classes and you're doing that right, I'm sure you're getting to know the other people in the class, and maybe that teacher is going to help introduce you to people, and you're going to do the networking there, too. Very, very cool. And uh, so that will be the end of our discussion of breaking right. in. That's uh, it. Newbies, you're on your own. Yeah, newbies, you're on your own. Uh, well, Go actually, away. not on your own. Children <laughs> of Tendu yes. is a word I can't, is a, is a name I can't say enough. Pretty much everything you need to know about breaking in, staffing, what it's like to be a staff writer, and all that, you'll find at great length on Children of Tendu podcast. It's, it's sort of like a prerequisite of um, somebody who wants to break in, just to know the language of the industry. Yeah, it's, it's podcast college. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, uh, Javi and Jose are both friends. They are, uh, they do it the best. Um, uh, present company excluded, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, it's really great that you are willing to um, plug other podcasts mm. on your podcast. It's the first time I've seen someone do that. Um, uh, so kudos. Uh, but yeah, um, uh, Children of Tendu goes through the entire career from like getting started and getting people to read your stuff and about networking to episodes about your first days in the writer's room to uh, when you're up to pitching or, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you can sort of find what it is you want and look for the episode title that covers the subject you want, and, and they just get everything right. Um, uh, I do exactly what you just did. When, when anybody asks me, you know, out walking amid the world uh, for advice or where to find advice, um, that's the first thing uh, out of my mouth. A, a producer on elementary uh, cornered me in the production office uh, once, and this is just an example that came to mind. It's not a rare story. And it, these, they very often start the same way, which is some variation of my neighbor's grandson is interested in breaking into television, or my nephew is a really good kid and he really needs some help. Um, uh, you know, how, where, where should he go for advice, how, how to break in? And she, she wasn't even done asking the question. I like grabbed a post-it off a desk and just wrote children of tendu dot com mm -hmm. and just handed her that post-it. That's, that's the answer. Um, yeah. Uh, then the other, the other great thing that, that those guys do right, both in life and talking about it on the podcast, is talk about the, the ethical parts of it. Uh, it's a, um, uh, a tender uh, topic, uh, working in a field that is by nature um, ego-driven and competitive and necessarily collaborative necessarily putting a bunch of people in a room together who have to get a story up on the board together. Um, and uh, a career that, like we were already just talking about networking, you cannot succeed as an island. You have to be friends with people and staying in contact with them even when you don't need them. Uh, and so the lessons of being just a good person are 
I think, critical to figuring out how to navigate this career too. Um, and they just nail all that. Well, you mentioned on, on StoryBeat how talent is, is about fifth importance. Fifth. Yeah. yeah, according to Sam Simon, talent yeah. is fifth. Uh, uh, tell uh, me a little about, about that. Uh, let's, that so, is one thing we'll, we'll reestablish here. Sure. So um, uh, Sam, uh, who has unfortunately since passed away, uh, he's the co-creator of The Simpsons. Um, he, uh, the, the Writers Guild Animation Writers Caucus, which is, a, as it sounds, a group of animation writers, um, uh, give out a, uh, a Lifetime Achievement Award annually, and one year we gave it to Sam. Uh, and it came out at his Lifetime Achievement Award gathering. I don't remember whether, I think he said it himself, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, that, that his formula, his, his belief, uh, is that success in Hollywood is a combination of five things in this order. Dumb luck, hard work, tenacity, who you know, and then maybe talent. Um, I found that to be very accurate. Um, you can argue maybe about the order of those a little, a little bit, but he's right. And, and, I, and I really want to add, when I, when I comment on that, people think that I'm discounting talent. I'm not. There you go. Know, if it made it into the top five, it's really important. Um, but hard work is farther up the list, and tenacity is farther up the list. You, you know, the the people who succeed are the ones who stick with it. So that's the, those. Those are maybe the most important lessons that that a discussion like this can offer: is stick with it. You know, when you've been doing this a few years and the person who was sitting next to you in class uh, who maybe you thought was more talented, maybe, you know, that was just your, you know, your head spinning, but they gave up, you're the one who's going to succeed. Well, and, and I believe that applies to all levels, too. I mean, the further sure. on I get in the industry. And everything I mean, else in life. Uh, yeah, right? I mean, you, you have been very fortunate that you've had some long stints on, on shows and yeah. pretty much back to back. Yeah. Not everybody has that experience. Um, and there will be people who have a, a resume a mile long and all of a sudden, none of their shows hit. Uh, the, all the stuff they're pitching, maybe they have a, this giant overall deal and nothing happens with it. Right. And, and we all have to be continually writing. I, I talked to writers who've been showrunners who are writing new specs, who are writing new pilots, oh, who sure. are continually refreshing their their samples, um, particularly if they want to shift genres or, or that kind of thing, we, we can't ever stop. Yeah, that, that's a really great point the, when you talk about the shifting genres. Um, everybody's heard about pigeonholing. Um, there is a, um, a drive in this business uh, to, to define people. Uh, and, and it makes sense. It's a very, very risky business. Um, uh, like in any business where people are throwing around significant amounts of money, they want to mitigate their risk. They want to know what it is they're putting money into. Uh, you look for a track record uh, that, that shows that this person can do the thing you're about to write a very big check to let them do. So it's not to insult that. You can understand why pigeonholing happens. But what it means about to you as the writer um, is every time you want to do something that isn't exactly what your resume suggests to people you can do, it is on you to prove you can do it. Um, and that means write another script. That means write something new. And even then, by the way, you, you have to enter into that, by the way. This is another part people don't often tell you. Knowing that you're taking a risk um, because even with that script in hand, People may say, well, sure, this is a good sample, but this guy has you know, 10 years of writing specifically this kind of show. Just because they wrote one script of this kind of show, they're still not the safe bet. Um, but if you write something that is really good, blows people out of the water, it's, it's, it gets harder to ignore. Mm. Well, and, and you can spend a lot of time at a certain level. I, I interviewed Corey Miller, who's now show running shows like CSI, but when he started, he started as a writer's assistant, mm -hmm. and he got a couple of freelance scripts very early on, on, on Lois and Clark, 
And then he went 10 years as an assistant. Mm -hmm. Before he could convince people that he could get in at that next level. Mm -hmm. And I think we all have that syndrome where we hear the success stories and we think it was overnight. Right. Or we think that's the way it happens with everybody. Right. I saw somebody on Twitter recently who posted that she began as a writer's assistant a year ago and now she's on staff. Great for her. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a rare thing. And, and yeah, there's, there's the cliche of the, the 10 year overnight success. It's a person worked for 10 years, then they became an overnight success. Um, everyone's specific story is gonna be different. Everyone, like another reason to sort of skip past, you know, spending too much time on the how did you break in question is it's never gonna be exactly the same for anybody. No one should try and like hear one of these and emulate exactly what that person did. But there are patterns that you'll hear and obviously getting your foot in the door as an assistant is one of them. But, but even then, you know, not to rehash the whole thing, but sort of a very quick recap of mine as, as just indicative of how these roads can be sinewy. Um, I got a job as a writer's assistant very quickly did uh, move up the like got to write freelances, got to become a staff writer. Um, that was all within like a period of maybe six to eight months at that point. Um, was on staff at Warner Brothers Animation, writing, I would argue, the, the best kids animation out there at its time. Um, uh, for five years, and five years from like getting off the plane in Los Angeles, I was already, I'd already sold and was running my own show and then had to kind of start back at the bottom. And it was a number of years, I don't know if it was four or five years, something like that, that I was trying to break into one hours. Uh, some of that was going back to trying to write spec features, but, but basically, let's say, four cycles of, of trying to get into one hours, trying to get an agent, um, that it was crickets um, until Jack Kenny, who you know, gave me the job on Warehouse 13. Um, and it's been great since then. Again, as you said, great stability. Uh, but you just don't know. And you, as I said in that other podcast where you referred people to, you always have to just take the long view. You always have to say, you know, believe in yourself and stick with it. Um, and, and just, just keep going. Yeah. And I think to the point earlier about how so much attention is on breaking in, breaking in, breaking in, that there can be this idea that once you're on staff that it's all smooth sailing. Yeah, yeah. One of the biggest appreciations I got from listening to Children of Tandu is the trials and tribulations. It's all up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, and for guys who have, I mean, Jose Molina and, and uh, Javi, and Javi, they've worked on, I mean, Javi, he's created and run his own show. And Jose's yeah. worked with James Cameron, and, and you think, well, now it's happening. But it's still trials and tribulations. And you're only as good as what you did six months ago. And was it with the right people? Well, that you're absolutely right about, that um, you have to assess what each job is going to look like on your resume, in addition to all sorts of other factors. Um, sometimes, you know, most importantly, I need to pay my rent. Um, uh, and do I love this show? Uh, the other thing about th that you just said that I, I wanted to touch on is there's, there's an expression I wish we could purge from showbiz conversations, which is the, uh, I'm just paying my dues now. This one's just dues um, because it's all dues. You never, you never stop having to prove yourself. You never stop um, needing to fight for the next job. Um, I, I mean, there, there are people who uh, get very lucky very early, you know, do something, you know, that just explodes them onto the scene, like write a blockbuster feature, you know, out of the gate, who can then, if they're so inclined, kind of coast, you know, just sort of slowly slide down the spiral of, well, that last job on my resume, I can get this next job without... <clears throat> Uh, without breaking a sweat. And then that job can get me this next job without breaking a sweat. But that will be a decline. Um, uh, if you want to maintain where you're at or you want to do something different, you're always fighting for that next job. Um, and uh, perhaps counterintuitively, the 
the glut of peak TV that we're in right now, that there are 500 shows, um, and it seems like almost anything can be a TV show now, uh, it hasn't reduced that competition. Uh, if anything, things feel more competitive than ever right now um, because the, uh, the rooms are smaller and the orders for episodes are smaller and the shows you want to be on maybe are fewer or the shows that you can get in into uh, are fewer. Uh, and so uh, every, every pitch, every show you try to staff for, um, some, somebody said to me when I was trying to break in, I was complaining about whatever the, the, the climate was at that time. Oh, people are saying this is the hardest time to break in. And, and, and he said, yeah, I've been doing this for whatever it was, 10, 20 years. And, and every year people say this is the hardest year to break in. So I'm just repeating that, that it feels like it's as hard as ever or the hardest it's ever been. And maybe the lesson is, as this person said, it just always feels like that. We're going to take a break to hear from our sponsors, and we'll be back to talk a lot more about the landscape right now. DrivingFootage.com provides 4K nine-angle driving plates for film and television. Over 14,000 clips are available for locations all around Southern California, with more areas coming soon. A fully equipped camera car with height-adjustable rig is available for custom shoots and second-unit photography. Get more realistic driving shots so your viewer will pay attention to the story. Visit drivingfootage.com for details. avgearguy.com provides computer and gear rentals serving the LA area, including laptops with final draft, as low as $9 a day with long booking rates available. They also scan photos, documents, video and audio tapes, and film reels to digital so you can easily share with your friends and family. Mention the name of the TV Writer Podcast and you will get 10% off your order. Visit avgearguide.com for details. Full disclosure, I do own both of these companies. By supporting them, you help me bring new in-person video interviews to you. Okay, now that we're back, I have a little bit of insight on this because 10 years ago, back in 2010, I was having lunch at the Warner Brothers Commissary with a writer. He was at the mid-level and he was waffling over a chance to go to the executive producer level. He was being offered double his salary to take a job at that level. But in 2010, there were only, what, two, 212 shows? Now there's 532. So, so mm -hmm. literally less than half, about 40% of the shows. And at that time, there was a perception that if he took a job at that level, he may have a much harder time getting work because there, you know, there's so many other right. executive producers who had a lot more experience than him and he would be the greenest one in the room, and so he might have a hard time getting work. Now, it does hmm. seem, perhaps in contrast to what you just said, that there's a lot more executive producer-level jobs right now, though the jobs may be shorter, the episode orders are smaller, which have their own challenges because sometimes you're committed to a show and you can't yeah. take another job until it comes back, which is another problem in itself. Well, I want to I wanna, I wanna, I wanna turn, turn this dynamic around and ask you some questions right now off, off what you just said. Um, uh, I, I will just comment though on, on, on uh, uh, yes, I do think that there, there are more showrunner positions available right now, but, but yeah, as, as you said, uh, one of the concerns is that those are um, for shorter orders. Um, uh, there, there seems to be a, a pretty common complaint now that uh, it's hard to find good showrunners. So I don't, I don't know if the studios are opening the doors up to uh, more, sh more executive producers than they used to, uh, so much as, and this isn't to complain, I don't even know this is necessarily sure, it's just a sense I have, um, uh, giving the, the vetted group uh, more of the jobs. So someone who's you know, on the approved list might take a couple of those shows in a, in a year as a way to sort of keep themselves busy. Berlanti takes 30. Uh, well, <laughs> a, a, obviously a rare situation there. There, there. there are very few Greg Berlantis in the world. Um, but also, he is not running those shows day to day. Um, there's someone uh, who is, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, the person running that show, um, uh, one click, uh, you know, reporting to, to Greg. Um, he's obviously still the, you know, the, the final um, decision maker on, on, on things, but you still need 
a full staff that looks the same as it would in terms of heads in the room as it would if, if Greg wasn't in the equation. You still need somebody running that show day to day. Uh, probably they're too busy to be in the room all the time, so then you need a, a, a number two who is you know, the person in the room all the time. Uh, so so uh, he's not hoarding jobs. Um, he, you know, uh, obviously, and this goes back to that issue of, of business and risk, um, the, the studios and networks uh, much prefer to give a show uh, to someone who uh, has proven the ability to keep that train running smoothly and deliver ratings um, over and over again, even to the, uh, the effect of giving a small group of people a lot of shows uh, than they are willing to, to take flyers on, on others. Uh, I wanted to ask about this mid-level writer who became an EP that I assume that person did. You said it was a he? At, at the time, he turned it down. He did. I want to be very clear. I don't want to know this person's name. I don't want to know who it is. Um, but I'm kind of curious, how did that choice work out for him? I think at the time, it was the wise choice. He ended up staying on a show longer at the mid-level, and then when that show ended, he did get his own show. Well, good for him. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe that's just a testament to, like, maybe, maybe either a choice would have worked out because this guy had the talent and had the chops and um, was able to run a room, and, and so it, it happened for him eventually. Um, uh, if, he, if, if I was there to, to whisper in his ear at the time, um, I would have said what uh, you know, I've heard other people advise, and it, it always seems to be true, um, uh, which is take that job. Um, there's, there's no shame. There are no demerits in the business for being an EP on this show and being a co-EP again on the next show. Um, it happens so frequently that it's not uh, a mark against you. Nobody, and, and by the way, it's kind of unique to being up at the top level. Um, I, I wouldn't say the same thing for someone who is at the exec story editor level and is being told, well, you can have this next job, but you've got to go back down to story editor to do it. Um, there might still be plenty of good reasons to take that job, but uh, don't worry, it won't be a problem on your resume isn't one of those reasons. Um, I think it's downright crappy of uh, the studios to put people in positions like that, or sometimes uh, showrunners put people in those positions. Um, you have to repeat this level, even though our contract promised you that you'd go up a level now. Uh, I think it's horrible that writers are put in that position. Obviously, sometimes you got to suck it up and do it. Um, but, but those just stink, and, and there is no kidding that it's going to look weird on your resume in the future. But up at the very top, those people jump between EP, co-EP, and co consulting producer uh, so fluidly uh, that it's, it's, it's never going to be bad that the guy got that, that EP position. And when you're playing the long game, you often have to do things that you know you need for your career. Yeah. Like, say, for instance, you created and ran your own animated show you created the character for that show, and then you were basically down to the very bottom yep. staff-level writer on Warehouse 13. Right, right. Yeah, so that um, uh, slightly different than, than that happening in a, in a one hour. I think if somebody went from show writer to staff writer in a one hour, that would be very, very unusual. Um, I mean, it's unusual that I did it, because there, I, I can only think of maybe one other writer, um, David Slack, who, who had a similar uh, career trajectory as I did, and, and, has, uh, and has had the, the longevity uh, as well. Um, uh, but I mentioned the, you know, the, the few years of famine there between my animation years and my live action years. Uh, and what became abundantly evident uh, between my agent and my manager and myself, and we had very serious conversations about this, uh, was that the, the animation resume wasn't uh, doing me any favors. Uh, back to back to pigeonholing. Um, it it looked to the world like I was an animation writer uh, with with uh, a, a lot of rings in the tree. If you'd cut me open, um, and someone asks at that point, well, isn't that what this guy should be doing? Um, or we can't take a flyer on him. Um, and so I really had no choice but to be willing to start again at Staff Writer, and even then it was difficult, and it took 
the right opportunity and the right people and the right show and sort of for the stars to align uh, to, to get that opportunity. Well, I want to talk a bit right now about something I'm hearing a lot about in the last five years-ish. And I don't know if it's because of the giant doors opening with streaming, new streamers coming all the time and then putting a lot of money into shows and that kind of thing. It, it, it seems like in the last five years, I, I, I keep in touch with a lot of showrunners. Right. I'm hearing a lot more about showrunners who enter overall deals or maybe not even overall deals, but are spending a lot more time developing. You're, you're developing right now. Yeah. And, and this is different than somebody who's building new samples to break into a new genre. This is actually paid development, or at least where a studio is, is, has expressed interest in a certain project and you're developing it further. Can you talk about this? Because I don't think there's a lot out there who have talked about this sort of no man's land of development. Because I know showrunners who hmm. maybe their last show ended in 2015 and they've spent the last four or five years constantly developing new shows that didn't fly yet. Um, I'll see, like, uh, and any any discussion of sort of the broader uh, market factors about that will will be speculation. I'll kind of give that that caveat. I mean, I can tell you what I see, but I haven't had a lot of conversations with people about, hey, why are you choosing to develop right now? Um, but I kind of have some some instincts because I'm kind of feeling it myself. Um, uh, to to just sort of give uh, you know the, a little context about my own situation right now, because uh, you mentioned it. So so elementary is now. Uh, in the can for a year. Um, it, uh, uh, in fact, over a year. Uh, episodes aired uh, this past summer, so it still kind of feels fresher, uh, which is good news for, for one's resume. Um, uh, but uh, last year specifically, and it was the first time I was in a position like this, um, where I probably could have jumped, I definitely don't want to say easily because, as I said, Every job is a, is a, uh, is a challenge now. Uh, every job is competitive. But uh, I, I you know, probably would have had, let's say, better than average odds coming off the show I was coming off to, to get onto another show. Um, and I chose to develop. Um, and had, this is kind of worth describing, um, uh, an example of each of the three ways that can go all happened for me within this past year. By that I mean I wrote a new pilot completely on spec. Um, I went in and pitched to the studios and sold a pitch, sold a pilot to ABC and wrote that script for ABC. That's now at least for the moment run its course in that pilots are shooting right now and mine wasn't one of the ones they chose to shoot. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about those numbers but that's sort of a um, a game of elimination rounds and, and eventually, you know, mine got the cut. Um, and, and what's that? Most get them. Uh, uh, by far. Yeah. Um, and there's no shame in that. Um, uh, we can talk about that in a second. Um, and the, uh, I also, uh, the, the, the catchphrase for it is, is want a bake off. Um, and I don't know if you've had people talk about that on, on your podcast before, but basically, um, a, a studio uh, or some other entity, a pod perhaps, will put out word um, that they have some IP in their hands and they're looking to develop this into a series um, and the, the door is relatively open for people to come in and, and pitch their take on it or at least meet on it and, and discuss what their take would be if they were to go down this road. Um, and uh, I went in and um, uh, had a meeting on one of those, uh, gave my take on, uh, on what I would do with this. It's a YA novel, um, uh, how I would adapt it to series, and, and won that bake off. And that's the thing that I'm, I'm currently writing for, for Sam Raimi. Um, so that's also for pay. Um, so those are kind of the three versions. Um, you know, <laughs> win a job, <laughs> pitch one and create your own job, or just write it on spec and then hope to get out there and sell it. Um, uh, or just use it as a writing sample even. Hopefully, hopefully both. Hopefully something's gonna, the new script is gonna serve both purposes. Um, but having been through that, I definitely can feel the, the, the impulse uh, to say, well, I kind of have the taste for doing my own thing. Um, and the available 
jobs out there, um, good as those shows may be, wonderful as those showrunners may be, maybe if I'm looking at the career trajectory I'm interested in or what it is I want to do next, maybe these aren't the next stepping stone to get me across that river. Right. You know, maybe I want to go this way and they're all pushing me in this direction. Um, and since everyone has to be the, um, the, the captain of their own career, I do get that sometimes that would be the choice to make. Um, and in particular, because nowadays what you can do in television is at the like, broadest range of possibility ever. Um, there's, it's almost hard to come up with something that, that's an exaggeration, but it's, it's harder than it used to be to come up with something that can't be a television show. There's kind of a, a business model and a market for you know, just a thousand times more kinds of shows and stories you want to tell and characters you want to put on and, and audience sizes than there used to be. And at the same time, specifically broadcast, specifically network TV, feels like its focus is narrowing and narrowing and they're taking fewer risks. Um, you kind of look at what's getting made on TV right now and every year a bigger and bigger percentage of those shows are reboots of existing shows or um, uh, adapting some known franchise, you know, something from the movies or something from a novel series um, into television. So that, that's also a sign of, of less risk being taken there. And so, hearkening back to what we were talking about, uh, about how writers are always looking to redefine themselves, always looking to do something new, prove they can do something. For a lot of showrunners or people on the cusp of showrunner, uh, taking that next job as the number two chair on someone else's show that by definition isn't going to be taking the risks they want to take may not look as appealing. And, and talk about self-expression because that's something you talked about on, on one of the other podcast right. interviews. How it was important to you as a writer to get your stories out. Do you feel that burning to have your creation sold? And, and is that at this stage of your, of your career what you're pushing towards? Yeah, the, the, the answer is sometimes. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a, uh, a, a measure of my, my ego not being where some other people's are um, or a, a failing in my ambition, um, but I, I, I don't always have the same, like, you know, burning need that this be the song of my soul that, that I, you know, um, uh, that, that, you know, I've, I've got something more important than other people have to tell the world, and, and so it's got to be my show. Sometimes that pops up. What happens more often for me is I have faith in this idea. I've come up with something that I know in my heart is going to make a good show, and I know in my heart is going to be entertaining, and I know in my heart can run 150 episodes. Not that the business seems to even be looking to do that anymore. I wish they were and keep trying to sort of pull them back in that direction. Um, uh, so when, when something like that comes up for me, um, I will you know, dig in my nails and, 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 and not let go. Um, the other thing that is true for, I think, a lot of people out there, certainly a good number of them that I talk to, I, I often hear a writer go, boy, is it great to be the one making the decisions? Um, I just, you know, finally I'm in a place where, you know, I get to call the shots and they're doing the show my way. Um, and having been in the, the runner chair on the Zeta project, my observation is uh, that person either hasn't been doing it long enough to notice that that's just not true, <laughs> or um, they're deluding themselves, or they haven't done it at all and they just think that's what it's going to be like when they get there. Or, and there are some very, very rare occasions in the business where that actually does happen. But they are very, very rare. Um, the truth is everyone has a boss. Everyone has a customer that they're producing a product for. 
um, and or providing a service for. Uh, and so even though you're a showrunner, you are still answering to the studio and the network and the ratings uh, and the sponsors. And if you're a studio or network executive, you've got uh, the, the board and the sponsors and you know, the, there's the, the dollar. You know, you're, um, there's always somebody up the chain uh, that, that you still have to report to and who gets to win the arguments when they want to. Um, uh, I, one, one of my, God, I hate to, one of my catchphrases in my career since, since Zeta Project has been the network gets to win every argument they want to. Um, so even when you're in the, in the showrunner chair, you're picking battles, you're, you're thinking about like, is this the one, like, is this the hill worth dying on? Um, uh, I'd much rather uh, you know, dig in and fight for something that's going to truly affect the quality on the screen than, you know, whether I got respected or this was done according to my creative vision versus another way that would also be okay. And I mean okay in terms of, I don't mean like less than in terms of quality, but also emotionally true, also true for the character. Um, uh, you know, or, or at least will go by quickly enough that it won't do any, you know, lasting damage. Uh, uh, but uh, when, you, when you decide to really dig in, it doesn't matter if you're right. It doesn't matter if creatively it would be better. It doesn't matter if the idea that you're being told to do will destroy the show. If the network wants to get what they want, they will get what they want and you will be fired, and someone else will do what they want, um, or they'll just cancel the show. Like, they will always get to be right at the end of the day, and you just have to accept that and then enter your battles, as Sun Tzu would advise, knowing which ones you can win, uh, or which ones are worth, you know, seppuku over. Very, very good insight. One of the things I do want to move towards is, is building rooms, staffing a show. Let's say the Sam Raimi project goes, and you're in a position, you've got the green light, yep. now you need to staff the show. So how would you approach building that staff? Well, uh, a, a disclaimer uh, uh, ahead of time, uh, I haven't done it since animation, since I haven't been in the, that chair uh, since my days in animation. Uh, and when I did it in animation, uh, the, my writing staffs on, on Zeta Project were very small. Um, but, I, but I have some sense, so I can, I can speak to it, and, and th th there may be other people who can speak to it better. Uh, tell me if this is the direction that, 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 you're, that you're looking for. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the second something is, is uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, word gets out in ways that, that you can't control and, and may not even like, understand how people heard about it. Um, and you are flooded with submissions. Um, uh, agents and managers you've never heard of suddenly have your direct cell phone number and your email uh, and are you know, pushing to put your, uh, their clients in front of you. Um, and in addition, you know, more welcome avenues are, are submitting things in front of you. Um, the, the people who you're working for, studio, network, streamer, whoever it is, uh, will have, uh, the production company you're working for, uh, we'll have a pile of scripts that uh, you uh, are, you know, uh, expected to to give priority reads to. Um, I was damn lucky that that's how it worked on Warehouse 13 because, and I know you've heard the story before, uh, Tom Lieber was the studio exec uh, putting scripts in front of Jack, uh, and Jack was very agreeable to, you know, hiring who Tom thought were, were you know, good writers. I mean, obviously Jack vetted them himself and we all had meetings and had to get along with them and, and he made those decisions, but he said himself, so I'm not saying anything he hasn't, um, that you know, Tom suggested writers and, and Jack took Tom's advice in terms of the pile that he read. Um, uh, if you're living in a time when writers are represented by agents, um, or the, the big agents, and obviously a lot of agencies are, are in the game still, um, uh, your own agents and managers and, and uh, you know, your, the people close to you uh, will be suggesting writers and those people often get priority. Um, so that's how you get scripts in front of you. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, sort of take 
pretty focused, narrow views on, on genre that they're reading. You know, we want to see that this writer um, has the chops to do a hospital show. We want to know that this writer knows action and set pieces and, and you know, guns and jumping over cars, and we want to see that in the script. Um, and obviously there's an importance uh, to that. Uh, I personally am much more interested in good writing. You know, I just want to know when I'm reading this script, does this writer know how to bring a character to life on the page? Know how to tell something that's emotionally true? Know how to st structure a scene, when to get into the scene and when to get out of it? Um, how to write clearly? Um, uh, too often, and this, this really like ruffles me, uh, writers all the way up to the top of the food chain, and I mean the very top of the food chain, um, don't write clearly. Um, they, they write in ways that I'm sitting there reading it trying to decipher what it is they meant by this or what the image I'm supposed to see is. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking for that just sort of good, good writing 101. Then you meet with people and you see, do you get along? Um, do they, um, you know, are, are you going to uh, enjoy spending 10 hours a day for months on end in a room with this person? And are they going to get along with the other people you've, you've built a room around? Um, very often you might want to um, uh, fill, like check a box in terms of a skill set. Like, you know, even though I, you know, I might not, if I was doing a hospital show, I might not care if every writer in the room does hospital. But, you know, if there's somebody who, you know, was an ER doc before they became a TV writer, of course that person is going to, like, be interesting for me to get into that room. Uh, or somebody who has a life experience um, that, that speaks to the characters on the show, then, of course, that's going to matter, too. Um, uh, I can't speak as much to this next thing because it's something s someone else talked about and, and, and I, I, you know, it was sort of their system and I, I don't have a, you know, uh, as, as, as strong a handle on it. But I do know that, that some people will sort of kind of build, this is a weird word for it, but like a, a psych profile of the room. You know, like, well, you know, how many alphas am I throwing into this, this room? And, 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 and how many, um, uh, you know, idea machines versus good structure people and, you know, sort of make sure that, that you've got kind of all that handled. Um, so that's another thing to think about. And, and um, you know, you've probably heard before, there's, there's a whole bunch of skills. Like if you find the perfect writer, they've got all of them, but it's pretty rare to find it because a lot of them are sort of antithetical in terms of personality types. You want somebody who's good on the page and has good interpersonal skills. Those don't often go together well. You want somebody who just brainstorms like crazy, but knows how to like be disciplined enough to structure a script. Those often don't go hand in hand. So sometimes, yeah, you want some people who are like this and some people who are like this. Um, uh, I, I toyed on Zeta Project um, with uh, including, you know, like here's somebody who I know is great at script and here's somebody I know who's better at outline. Um, and, you know, maybe I don't need each person to be great at both because I can put them together or I can have this person churning out stories and this person writing the scripts off them. Uh, so a whole bunch of factors can come into play. And what are the things that stand out in a bad way? <laughs> what, are, what are the things that oh, God. I mean, you got, it's in any hiring situation, you've got 200 scripts. Yeah, yeah. And you have to have a way to filter through pretty quickly. What are the things that stand out that make somebody go to the good pile and what are the things that send somebody to the bad pile? At script, because I'll tell you, my, my impulse when you asked it was to talk about when you meet them. That too. Let's start there. Okay. Um, a, the, the big no-nos in a, in a meeting when you're looking to get a job um, are lack of enthusiasm um, uh, and lack of knowledge for the show, uh, knowledge of the show. Um, to, to now speak about those things in positives when you're going into a staffing meeting. And it doesn't matter what meeting it is and what chair you're going for. These are just true at every stage of your career. Um, you got to go into that meeting like this is the show you were born to write. You are hungry to get this job. That's different from desperate. 
you that that's a that's a big turnoff, you know. It just and and you know, I don't know if I'm immune to it, but I would hope that like you know I'm more forgiving, um, just knowing that I've been the guy who, you know, couldn't hide my nerves, uh, in meetings before, and, and sometimes you're just nervous, and that's human. That's being human, um, uh, but it's it's far less enrolling to hire somebody who you feel like is there because next week they're going to be wearing a barrel with suspenders if they don't get this job. Um, or uh, even worse, and I've been in meetings like this, where the vibe someone gives off is like, yeah, I'm just kind of looking for any job. And you know, yeah, I, I could write your show in my sleep. And I'll just do this one. Um, this was me putting my elbow on a couch. I don't know if this is pantomime. Um, uh, I, in, in my earlier years, I've made mistakes like that. Um, uh, it, it's, it is the kiss of death. Um, you want to show up in a meeting like um, you've watched every episode or as close to every episode as you could in the time allotted, and sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes a show knows, we've been on the air five seasons, and this person got the phone call to, you know, that there's an opening for the show two days ago. So they know you're not going to have watched all of it. But you want to be informed. You want to have salient things to say about the show. Um, and there's, there's a whole distinction that needs to be made there. There's like, on one hand, it's not a book report. You're not like showing that you can name the characters and, and certain episode storylines or what they're doing on the show. Um, you wanna have like new things to contribute, but at the same time, you don't wanna come in like your ideas are the end all and, and like another no-no in these meetings is like, I'm coming in and I know how to fix your show. <laughs> People, people used to talk about that all the time on, on the, the 90s Star Trek shows on Next Gen yeah. and DS9. They would have all these people walking in going, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I've been a fan since the, the original series. Here's what you're doing wrong, and I'm going to make it better. <laughs> you don't get hired when you tell a showrunner, yeah. here's what you're doing wrong. But if you come in and you've gotten into that showrunner's head, hmm. which, by the way, is, is that's a, that's a saying to remember and, and would apply to a lot of things. Your job, when you get the job, is to get into the showrunner's head. You want to write like them. And you've, if you walk in there in that meeting and show them that you're already doing that, like my homework before coming to this meeting was I've started the job I hope to do when I get here, which is get into your head. Hmm. Here's what I notice you're doing. Here's what I think is really cool about what you're doing. Here's a cool opportunity that like, you know, let's take something you're doing to an extension maybe that, you know, you didn't think about, but just spitballing it for you, you know, I'll drop it in a heartbeat if this isn't the direction you want to go. Maybe you have some ideas for episodes. You've got to be careful about that because sometimes they want those, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. But if that's the, the, the vibe you're coming from, I'm here to make your life easier. I'm here to, to get into your head and replicate you, um, which is, by the way, how I behave. Mm -hmm on the, in the meetings where I get the jobs. Yeah. You know, I was really explicit to Rob Doherty on elementary. You know, my job when I get here is to be, you know, another arm of Rob Doherty. Hmm. And I kept that promise for, you know, for, for the six years that I was on that show. Um, so now on the page. Hmm. That's, that's uh, I, I don't have anything as, as, as quick, but other than the things I've already said, which is um, you, you want writing that's clear, you want characters that are real. You want to feel life in those characters. Um, you want to feel, I do anyway, like the writer imagined this material fully. And I mean that on both the sort of series conceptual level and the scene level. This is, by the way, a big challenge, especially for writers at lower levels. Like, while I say all this, I, I promise I'm very forgiving um, when I read lower level writers. And, and I wasn't, in, in my early days, I, like everybody else, I started as a writer's assistant. I started reading scripts from other submissions mm. when I was on Alan Burnett's desk. And, and he kind of had to smack that into me. I would like be throwing things in the reject pile and he'd look at some of them anyway, just kind of rightly checking up on whether I was on the same page as him. And he'd kind of put some back in the meat pile and he'd say, yeah, but you gotta, you gotta know what level these writers are at, and and you know I see some possibilities and some promise in them, that you know they're not there yet. But I know you know, hmm. I know that I can, I can work with this clay. I can shape this. Um, and so you have to think that way when when you look at, at you know you have to know what level you're reading at. Hmm. Um, but the, the the gold standard, is, 
somebody who's writing, who has imagined it so fully and writing it so clearly that you know exactly where you are geographically in the scene. You know what the room you're in looks like. And then you got to do it economically, mm -hmm. which is even trickier, right? Like to, to, um, to, to write as if you were an expressionist painter, like with just a couple of dots and strokes, you've, you've evoked this kind of person or this space that they're in. Um, uh, kiss of death for me, first and foremost, is, is dialogue that doesn't sound like it would come out of a human being's mouth. Mm. Um, dialogue that is um, the writer thinking they were really clever um, or uh, in service of where the plot needs to go in a way that just isn't logically or emotionally true. Um, th those, those are the biggies. Mm -hmm. Um, people who use only one space after a period. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> the, the, and the, the rule there is do what the showrunner does. Yeah. That's the only answer that matters. Mm -hmm. you're, you, you are, you're, your job is to get into the showrunner's head even down to punctuation. Mm -hmm. But obviously when you're writing your spec, you're your own showrunner. Do yeah. whichever one you want. Oh, actually a good question uh, is do you like to read specs versus pilots? Uh, do you have a preference? Uh, again, I'll read anything. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I think you heard me talk about this at the, the panel where mm -hmm. we, we most recently saw each other. Yeah. We've known each other for years. Um, but uh, I, I, one, I think there's way too much burden on, like the, the, the gates are too high anyway as it mm -hmm. is, so I don't want to make rules about which one I'm going to read, which one I'm not going to read. Um, the, and, and I'm going to see what I need to see uh, with either one. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to see good writing either way. Um, but I do mourn uh, the, uh, the reduction of uh, writing specs of existing shows mm -hmm. uh, that's done out there. Um, I have to accept that you know, most showrunners, it sounds like, prefer to read pilots over specs. Mm -hmm. um, certainly other forces in the business, and I talked about those at that panel, um, push writers to write their own pilots rather than specs of existing shows. Um, uh, I held my tongue a little bit in that. It, so, so to bring other people up to speed, uh, uh, I was recently on a panel that was half writers and half people on the other side of the desk, um, uh, reps and producers. And um, the, the reps and producers, to a person, just want to read uh, uh, pilots um, that people have written. Um, and they, uh, their, their argument there uh, in addition to, I want to see the writer's voice, I want to see what they are bringing to the table themselves, um, is this gives me an opportunity to do something for that writer, to sell this thing, to put this thing out there. Um, and I, I take umbrage with, with that. Uh, I'll start talking to you again. Yeah. Um, uh, with that notion. Uh, because e even though, I mean, those are good people and they, um, they, meet, they have the best intentions, uh, they're, they're approaching the writers that they're working with as though they're panning for gold. Mm. Um, in other words, you know, like one, of these, mad men or yeah, one, one of these scripts is going to be that nugget that we're looking for. And by extension, one of these writers is going to be that nugget that, that we can, you know, make that person rich and make a mint ourselves. And, and you know, so how is that bad? But the problem with the panning for gold metaphor is that the vast majority of writers are the dirt. Mm -hmm. Um, and they get treated that way. Um, it's very, very, very hard. Well, it's hard to, to, to run a marathon before you run a 5K. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to, to write a spec pilot that is, like, that checks all the boxes that I just said, let alone actually is going to be, like, viable in the business and sell and make everybody a ton of money, that's, that's like expecting an asteroid to hit. Um, yeah, it happens every now and then, and you'll hear the stories about when it does, but it's, it's a very unfair burden to put mm -hmm. on somebody who's just starting out. That person, you know, to throw another metaphor, they need to learn to cr walk before they can run. You know, they, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they deserve the training wheels. And writing specs of existing shows, those are the training wheels. That's how you learn to write. You sit in front of the TV, and you press pause, and you take notes on the structure of a show, you figure out how they do it. You come here to the Writers Guild, uh, yeah, yeah, where the library has, you know, scripts that you can sit down and read, 
and and see the formatting that that show used. Which is was, open to the public. You don't it, have to be a member. Correct. It is open to the public. It's a um, it's not a lending library. You can't take stuff out. You have to sit here and read it. But they have um, a, a huge, huge collection of of scripts of existing shows and historical shows. Um, uh, it's also very easy nowadays to find scripts of shows online. Um, uh, a, a, a tip that, that someone pointed out is you search for that show name and include PDF in, in your Google search and, and you'll find scripts of that show. Um, so you read literally how those writers write it, um, whether they use one space or two after the period, and you learn to emulate. Um, that's how you're going to learn. Um, and that's how you're going to develop the skills necessary to be a writer on one of those shows because, like I said before, that's your job. Mm -hmm. Get into their heads, learn how they wrote it. Um, so I wish that there was a lot more of that, a lot more, you know, specking existing shows. Mm. Ellen Sandler's uh, TV Writer's Workbook is a great book that people don't read en enough because it talks about writing a spec. But if somebody wants to learn how to do that, it's a great book on that. Um, we're coming to the, to the end of our time, but something I do want to end with is not breaking in necessarily, but advice to your younger self. Yeah. If you could speak based on what you know now to your younger self, what, what kind of advice would you give? Uh, well, the, the, the advice that I mentioned earlier and, and is kind of always my, my, my you know, rule one, take, take the long view, um, would have been really useful for my younger self to hear. Um, and then sort of there are corollaries you know, that, that can branch off from that. Um, my, my younger self, um, you know, common for a lot of younger writers, um, particularly when I was breaking into one hours, I already was an old younger self. Um, uh, I, was, uh, I was desperate. Um, I uh, was very nervous that, that I was breaking into one hours late. Um, I was, uh, I acted it. Uh, in meetings, I kind of had, uh, or maybe two modes. Uh, my my very very first staffing meeting. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll say the exact name. It was with Amy Reisenbach, who is now the uh, the the head of, um, of God, one of the departments at, at at CBS Network, either either current or development. Um, uh, so she she was, I think, manager level at the time. So you know this is. You know, going back a bunch of years, um, so she was pretty new at this. It was my very first general, as they call it, the, the water bottle collection meeting, um, in one hours, and and uh, I was you know coming off running a show in, uh, in animation, and and God bless her, she 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 called my agent after the meeting and said, oh, he's a nice guy, but he kind of came across as cocky, <laughs> you know, he kind of acts like he knows it all, um, uh, so I had like that, like, gear, and the other one was. Desperate as hell, I know that I, there, there were showrunner meetings, and usually those were the showrunner meetings. Um, like for a couple of years, and you're lucky at that level if you get a showrunner meeting or two a season. Um, I would go into those meetings, like this is it. Like if I don't get this job, th then I'm I'm starving for another year, or you know I'm going to be a year older when I try and go out for staffing, and I would project that at a very high volume. I even remember saying in one of them, like the meeting wasn't going the, the way I wanted. And, and I was like, well, can I just, I, I really just want to say, because I feel like this is my chance. Um, and, and, you know, I tried to sell myself on them in, in a way that just wasn't, you know, enrolling, to use that word again. Yeah. And, and so for me, the younger self, what I needed to hear was chill out. Um, you, you're, you're talented. It'll come. Um, don't act, you know, either of those, like you know everything or, you know, you're, you're going on a bread line if you don't get this, this meeting. Um, just go be a human being. Everybody just wants to meet people who are human beings mm. um, and that they like. And, and do that stuff that I've talked about, you know, just, just let them know you're going to make their job easier. Let them know you're going to work harder for them than anyone else is going to come into this room. Um, and then you'll get the job. Awesome. Can't think of a better place to end up. Uh, thanks so much, Bob, for your time. Thank you, Greg. And uh, I th hope people like this. And, and please, please, please follow Bob on Twitter. I'll put the Twitter address in the show notes. 
And uh, if you have any questions about this interview, I'm sure, Bob, you'd be happy to answer. Uh, for sure. Uh, I'll warn that um, uh, Gray's right. Sure, follow me on Twitter, but uh, you know, bring, bring a sandwich <laughs> because it might be a year between tweets. Um, but yes, if someone, if someone writes questions to me, then for sure, uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye open and, and, uh, and respond. And may watch not, for panels at uh, WonderCon if, if it happens. Hopefully yes, if, it happens. If, if, if WonderCon happens this year, uh, I will be on one uh, uh, down in Anaheim, uh, uh, hosted again by uh, Spiro Skensos, who is a, a great panel host and, and, and a fine writer in his own regard and uh, does a great job hosting those things. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bob. Thank you. Contest code 86.